I am part of Tier 1 Coalition, and Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition is a horizontally aligned group. We are not top down. The steering committee just shows up for city meetings. We pay attention to what's going on, and we set up educational opportunities. But really, our organizing happens on a, on a horizontal level. For instance, the neighborhoods that took part in leading us in getting our neighborhood plans this last go around, you know, like Mackley Park, like the West Side neighborhoods, um, should be congratulated. And when we did the, uh, and this has been spearheaded by River Road. They're the ones that stayed on top of it, did the hard work. And so this isn't just coming from us, it's coming from you all. And hopefully um, that will happen more in the office. office uh, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> so it happened a little more often. Um, I want to let you know that there are restrooms. You go straight out that way down that hallway, and there that's where the restrooms are. There is coffee and, and some cookies available over there. Um, if you can spare a couple bucks, we have to pay for that out of our own uh, pocket. We're not a nonprofit. We're not a, an organization that uh, raises funds in that way, so any money for a little coffee fund would be appreciated. I want to make a couple of thanks. I want to thank um, River Road Neighborhood Association planning team for their work and leadership on this issue. I want to thank D.D. Gonzalez from San Antonio College for use of this center. And we try to rotate where we meet. We met last time at Lift Fun on the west side. We've met on the <coughs> south side, north side. And so we were really fortunate to get this today. I want to thank uh, D1 Councilman Trevino's office, specifically Chrissy McCain, for use of some of the charts that they wanted to make sure you understood was for educational purposes only. It's not an endorsement. And I want to make a special thank you to Drea, uh, Drea Garza of Monticello Park and her company, JDG Associates. They printed today's handouts and they have offered themselves um, to print in the future. So we are very thankful for that. <laughs> I also want to send out a thanks that's not written down and recognize NowCast. If it wasn't for NowCast, we would not have gotten as far as we have in, um, in, the, in the work that we're doing. The fact that she records these sessions and other sessions that have to do with city government, and we have that at our disposal, is invaluable. In fact, I would say a lot of our progress is due to the fact that we have a record of what was said. They are always looking for donations, and we will try to make available to you the place where maybe your neighborhood association would consider making a donation to them, because without them, I think really we'd be lost. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to also uh, ask you that when you sign in to meetings, to, to city meetings, that not only do you sign in your neighborhood association and your local coalitions, but could you also sign in as T1NC? I think, given the kind of negative press we've gotten from certain organizations, that they think it's the steering committee is T1NC, it's like we're the tiny little tip of the iceberg that they see at meetings, and they don't realize like there's a huge 46 neighborhood coalition that's underneath and working just as hard, but maybe it isn't as visible as those people that just show up to those specific meetings. So we ask you to please sign in as T1NC when you sign in your neighborhood association and your own local coalitions. Um, I want to introduce the steering committee. Um, I want to introduce, and I'd like you to stand up, uh, Butch Hayes from Magna Park, Terry Ibanez from Mission San Jose, uh, Ricky Kushner who did the sign in, Cosma Colvin from Beacon Hill, Ricky is from uh, Tobin Hill, Colin Jones from Dignity Hill, and Christine Drennan who's not here but is uh, from Keystone. So um, I guess we can get to, oh, our launch. We are going to launch our website and the website will be a place that you can go back and all the kinds of workshops we've done, you can get those materials because the point of you being here is to share with your communities. We don't make these open to like all the communities because we get the unwieldy. So what our expectation is that you're taking these back to your zoning people, to your neighborhood association meetings, and getting the word out to your communities about some of the things that we've covered. Uh, but that website will be launched on July 28th. We need pictures. 
We're going to do a banner of rotating neighborhood pictures. And if you could send maybe three or four pictures from your neighborhood that are kind of iconic, not just buildings. When I sent it in from Beacon Hill, I sent in pictures of some neighbors helping an elder in our neighborhood clean up her back space that she was getting code violations on. And she was unable to do it herself. In fact, my neighbor was working on that this morning. And I got a picture of those people working. Because in the end, the most important part of neighborhoods is neighbors. So uh, please send your pictures to the Tier 1 site, and we will put them up on our banner um, uh, when we launch on the 28th. And I want to thank Susana Garcia for her... Yes, sir. The uh, address of the Tier 1 website is... It's on the bottom of your handout. Okay. On several places I have... Uh, it says, for more information, it's on the, on the first will, one. What will the website be? The website will be from Tier 1, so it's going to be our mission statement, a list of the organizations. No, I mean the address. That I don't know yet, and I'll send that out by okay. email. Um, and there's a couple of you who, um, not you specifically, but people have signed in that aren't real legible in their addresses or their email, and we've gotten some that have come back or they're blocked. So, um, you know, please make sure that that's legible. Yes, sir. Yeah, the address uh, for the uh, website, the upcoming address is uh, www.t1nc.org. Currently, it's offline because it's in the middle of construction. Okay. But uh, okay, Numer numeral one. Yes, t1nc.org. Okay. And we will send that out by email, and that will be our repository of information of uh, things that are happening that we need to be aware of. Um, uh, Charlotte Ann said recently in a current article that the reason she does the work she does is because at city meetings, no one's paying attention, that our city's being radically changed, our neighborhoods, the plans to change them radically are happening, and no one's paying attention. We're paying attention. And that's what today, part of today is about. Let's talk about land use. And this isn't going to be high tech, this is going to be... Actually, this is going to be more of a conversation as soon as I get help. You see it on your screen. Everything I'm doing here, you have um, you have a copy of. I am probably in some ways, the person that should not be explaining this to you because I'm a beginner. I am, you know, I am not a city, retired city planner, but I believe that we, we need to break this down so all of us understand it before we start having the more complex conversations. Land use is, is the key to everything right now. Land use, no matter what else you're talking about in our neighborhoods, land use is the thing we need to be paying attention. And they are making changes to land use. And I, I don't want to appear that everything the city does is kind of nefarious, that they have bad intentions. But it's important for us to see that those unintended consequences, the things that, that affect our neighborhoods, that we advocate for things that help make, keep our neighborhoods strong. So, so land use is, think of it as the cover for everything. And zoning is underneath it. But zoning and land use are so closely tied together that in some ways you're almost talking about the same thing. There is talk in the city, and not from city officials, but other people on the peripheral, that we could end up going to, this is the first step, to what they call form-based zoning. And form-based form zoning is if you see a land use, residential, low-density residential, and you see all the zonings that are allowed inside of it, that someone, what if in your neighborhood someone could get a zoning change and not have to go through zoning? What if the city said, if the land use is appropriate, you can do any of those that you want? That's the way I want you to look at this document. Because what if, if you decide that those land uses, that's a, a appropriate, the urban low density residential is appropriate, and someone wants to go from R6, R6, R6 to MF18? And given they have the right square footage, right? Like, let, let's just kind of put that aside. That they could do that if we had form-based zoning. Now, there are things you can do to mitigate the effects of form-based zoning, but for today's conversation, we're going to just think of it in that way. So, these are some that I have attached in there. You have not only, and we're going to go through it, like some of the basics, but you have all of the zoning right now for San Antonio. 
So if you go, okay, I don't really know what an MP15 is, about the third document in is all of the zonings that you can look that up. And I'm going to send you all of this by e send this out by email as well as today. But here are some of the changes that are happening. So residential estate is, some, is, is something different than what most of us have in San Antonio. Let's start with low density residential. And, and before I get started, this was a document that got changed many times as it went through different commissions. So River Road worked very diligently with the city to help, help think about urban, um, urban uh, uh, zonings, but by the time it got through all the different commissions and committees, it got changed drastically. And that's why we need to kind of take a look at it today. So low density residential is pretty much what, what the suburbs are, right? So you've got R4s and R5s and R6s. So that means a house on 4,000 square feet, a house on 6,000, on 5,000 square feet. Urban low density gets to be more dense. dense. So you have single family, R3, R4, R5, R6, and then you start to have, it gets to be a little more complicated. You have R and 4, R and 5. So that means R and 4 is dense. That means four uh, properties on one, on, on, on one lot. On, on, and R and 5 is for 5,000 square feet, you have, I'm going to show you a chart here that will help you. Look at the chart that you have in there on um, on the, the, it's the picture. It'll help you visualize. You see it? Yeah, that's the one, the one with the picture. This one. That will help you visualize what these look like. So sometimes, even though MF33 sounds like a lot, in an urban lot, Really, we're talking about three three houses, or we're talking about um, yeah. Most of the time, it's three in a in a four thousand square foot or five thousand square foot lot. You're talking about um, just three houses. R and four, you can see, is actually equivalent to MF forty. It's a lot more, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. I mean, think about lots and areas in your neighborhood that could tolerate that kind of density. Because this is the truth of it. The truth is our neighborhoods are gonna change. There is no way that our neighborhoods are gonna stay exactly the way they are in 10 or 20 years. That people are coming, the city powers that be need to accommodate that, and the money is in our neighborhoods. What we wanna do is guide that change. We want to help guide good development in our neighborhoods that keep our neighborhoods um, um, viable that keep people from being displaced. So, so think about these, not only for today, but think about 20 years from now. What will your neighborhood look like? And it will not look the same as it does today, but can we do it when we, can take, when we continue having healthy neighborhoods? So, uh -huh. yes. so when they're looking at how things are built in the areas or what these zoning things are, which are very strange, and I can't get into the weeds yell at me this is a <laughs> so they do things by square footage and then by an acreage and so when you look at an acre it's 43,560 square feet so if you have an acre of land how many are fours which are one house on 4,000 square feet would go into one acre and so all of this is based on either square footage or acreage and so when you're looking at this when she's saying a multi-family 33 it's saying that you can have 33 units on an acre of land but it's only the acre of land without the setbacks so you have to take those into consideration the parking and how many buildings can go on that land and heights too general and, yeah and so density in the city is also by height how high can we go? So when you're looking at a multifamily 18, which is 18 units per acre, so you can only do how many within that in an acre that's usable land. 
you also know that an MF-18 can go higher than 35 feet. So you're looking at two and a half to three story building. If you do a multifamily 33, which goes up to a higher density, you have a higher uh, level of building of 45 feet. So you keep going up in height as well as the number of units that can be on your land. So when you're looking at these three units, you're talking about 45 feet. You're talking about, uh, you know, higher. And, and that may be something we address when the UDC comes up for changes in 2020. But right now, that, that MF33, you may say, I only want that on four doors. Not because I don't think a lot can have three you know, three houses on it, but because that kind of height doesn't work in the middle of single family, um, uh, single story or double story uh, bungalows or cottages. Much like on Craig and Beacon Hill, where we've got those towers right in the middle of a block of single family homes. Okay, so low density residential, urban density. Um, I know that there was some issue, and we'll talk about some of the issues in a minute, about the RM4 being in low density residential. There are a lot of folks who have concerns that maybe that would be better in a medium density residential. Or the category. Or categories. Yeah, yeah. A new category. A new category. And that's, I mean, this, thank you, Barbara. So, so that, you know, we can also uh, advocate for all new categories as well. I mean, we don't have to just think in terms of this frame. We can, we can go, be, we can get outside the box. Medium density residential is everything from single family to MF33s, uh, RM4s, and then the rest you can you can kind of look up. So these are 13 to 33 dwellings per acre. And you can look on your chart to see what some of those are. High density residential is RM4s through MF 65. I'm not sure why you would want a single family home in the middle of an MF 65, but okay. What's an MF 65? That is 65 units per acre. Now think about, but don't think about it in acre. So if you look at the bottom, then you start to see like there's an MF 33 on a half acre. In our, in our neighborhoods, most of our neighborhoods, that's not all our neighborhoods, because there's a lot of neighborhoods on the west side and south side where there is enough acreage to do this. Um, we don't have enough land available for that. But there are some neighborhoods, and some of you might be sitting here today, that they, they could, you know, that could possibly be something um, in a high density. But it seems like high density, that's, that's where you'd want it. Yes, ma'am. But still in all, uh, as Gemma was pointing out, you can't get stuck on the 33 per acre because, for example, I have half an acre and I'm zoned MF33. So that means for me that I can put a max of 16 units on that half acre. If you have smaller lots, the uh, higher the number, it's not that, oh, you could never put 65 units on this lot. Anyway, that's not the point. It's how many units can be fit on that lot and based on the, the number per acre, of course, the higher number per acre also means the higher number per half acre, the higher number per quarter acre. It's providing for a higher density. Thank you. When, when you make comments, um, Gemma Kennedy is from River Road. That was Coastal McColvin from Beacon Hill. Please uh, introduce yourself so we can get to know each other. Um, then you go on to um, neighborhood commercial, community commercial, regional commercial, and neighborhood mixed use. Those and urban mixed use. These are these are the new these are the categories that they've got it all in now. So um, as you're looking at your neighborhoods, you know the community commercial, the regional, depending if you have a community plan or a regional plan for your sub area plan, neighborhood mixed use. Um, in Beacon Hill, we have an area on Blanco that is this, it's just revitalized around the, 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 the Beacon. And it's, an, it's been a neighborhood mixed use, but it could end up being you know, community commercial. If I were a person who had a business, I would want as a big uh, customer base as possible. So we have a lot of C1s and C2s in our neighborhood. But these are the, the neighborhood mixed use is a little gentler. I just want to say this is 
very complicated. Yes. And very complicated. And I'll be looking at this a thousand times and see different things. Uh, the city is going to be doing some workshops because the planning department has been mandated to do so. But also, I know District 1 is going to be working and have some preliminary workshop to explain this again and also to work more hands-on, like how many buildings are we talking about, what do we need with our neighborhood. <coughs> so this is sort of the introduction yes. about what, what maybe you should be thinking about, because the city really is moving quickly with this. Chris Dawkins, Lakeside Neighborhood Association. What is the objective of this particular group? Where, what are we going towards? Um, do you mean today, or do you mean in general? In general. Well, in general, we, we have a policy because we're a, a, a horizontally aligned. We don't ever say, even if, I'm, if you're on the steering committee, we don't think we represent Tier 1. We say we're a member of Tier 1. And so it's up to each neighborhood to decide what they want to advocate for. I would think there's going to be enough overlap, and there usually is, no matter how different the neighborhoods are, we have some very basic things in common that we might want to decide these are some issues and everybody write their council person. And, and what I'll send afterwards, what we'll send is all the council people and the mayor's addresses. And here are some things you might want to think about advocating for or not. I mean, depending on your neighborhood. And, and, and or we can band together and show up at the meetings and say, I'm a member of 2-1, I have this concern. Because I, you need to attend those public meetings. You need to do the input. But a lot of times they don't give you the basic, and I know the cynicism of the input, input. Um, but, but, um, but you want to go in there informed. You want to at least understand this um, before you walk in those meetings. So, um, oh, that's my train of thought. so we'll talk about at the end some possibilities. One of the things we want to mention is why they would put in, for instance, there's some, there's some issue about the MF33 being in a medium density. Like, why would you put an MF33 in medium density? One of the things the city has found in these older neighborhoods is we are full of non-conforming uses. Um, the blocks that Cosima, for instance, lives in Beacon Hill, that whole block is MF33. The rest of it's low density residential, but there are areas that either grandfathered in. There were a lot of larger houses in my neighborhood that got turned into boarding homes. And then when they kept you know, changing over the zoning codes, somehow they got these, these you know, zones that were appropriate at one time and still are appropriate. I mean, you could argue you know, they've already been apartments for a long time. But, but that's the city's um, uh, concern is they don't want a lot of non-conforming. Our concern is, we. this is also a map to the future. So if a developer says, oh, well, I can do in that, in that area of their town, I can do MF33, let me put up those MF33s. So we've got, and, and Councilman Courage asked it at one of the recent meetings, he said, well, can those be grandfathered in? And he never got an answer. So that is a concern that we might have, is asking the city, what about those non-conformings, and how do we... You know, how do we help you grandfather him or what? But, but we, this is also a roadmap for the future. And we don't, maybe there's parts of our neighborhood we don't want to have an MF33. If you're mostly, um, if you're mostly medium and you have a lot of these RMs and Rs and suddenly you have an MF33 and they don't need a zoning change, if it's within that land use, I'm not sure that in all neighborhoods that would be appropriate. Okay, let's look at our neighborhoods. Are there any questions about, about this? I have a question. Your name? Oh, Velma. Been here with the uh, Whistler Square Neighbor Association and the Westside Coalition as well. On the on C2, so I was looking at the C2 with community commercial and regional commercial. commercial. It says C2, so where is the, uh, if it goes in, and like on the bottom it says for the regional that you can do automobile dealerships. Is this just is this gonna go on the size of the land? Because a C2 you we have a bulk right there, C2s. Mm -hmm. So how when you go and change it, mm -hmm. I mean how it's because of the, it's gonna they're gonna give it to you on the the, the size of your property. Mm -hmm. 
as far as um, what you can put there? Because you have two different. Well, it, you have to look and see. And so if you look on the west side, here's the Guadalupe west side. So, so I, I'm not going to scroll. I can tell you just because I kept it up here, even though I could hardly read it. But you can see that there are places where there's commercial. And if it's C1 or C2 on the list that I gave you, yes. you can look and see what are the permitted uses. For right now. For right now. Yes. yes. And this map, actually, on the website, and I've, I've given you the website address, and I'll be sending it to you as well, that you can go on this map. But this is, this is the future land use map. This is what they're calling the future land use map. It looks to me, when I look at my own neighborhood of Bacon Hill, that it's pretty much what's there now. But if you look and see, let's quickly, I think the yellow is, um, If someone has a good memory, <laughs> I uh, think the yellow, yellow is MF33. The yellow is MF33. Let's go over here. So, um, yeah, this is a little awkward, but, but you can kind of see the, the, the deeper okay, the so color. Okay, that's land you see, yes, meaning. Right. Okay, so if you go up to the west side, for example, All through the south. It's funny, I was at the tower not too long ago and looking down, and I saw the city only in terms of neighborhoods. I thought, oh yeah, that's Terry's neighborhood. Oh yeah, that's, you know, that's the west side of the neighborhood. That's. And then you have all the suburbs in their pale green. Okay, so here there's Delview, Almost Park, near Northwest, Midtown. Okay, let me use this for an example. So the Midtown neighborhood plan. You can see that, um, where am I? Midtown. So all of this is, is higher density, higher density and commercial. These are parks and schools. This is higher density. This is low density. This is where we are today. Um, but we have, like on Fred Road, we've got some industrial that we need to we need to look at. But like this is around where Cosmo lives. These are MF33s right in there, and we're not sure. And and for us, this looks like something most people would say they could live with. That you have the higher densities on the streets, and you have the neighborhoods are pretty much the lower density. And one of the things we're, we need to take a look at my neighborhood, and, and what I'm, I'm just showing this as an example, because this is what you need to do in your neighborhood, is I can look and say, okay, that part of, of Blanco is commercial. There's, there's a cool commercial area. But all of this down here, like where I live, that whole corridor is uh, residential. It may be higher density residential. That may be a place that you could put, you know, some denser stuff, but all of that is residential. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Tony Garcia with uh, the Montanista Historical Association. If you look at your neighborhood and you look at the zoning map and you say you print your zoning map and also print your land use map, you can do the overlay and see the corresponding land use for that particular zoning. People aren't, aren't aware of that. So, for example, MF33, uh, if you look at uh, your particular lots, you can see where the zoning is and then you can compare that to your land use map to get an idea how the two correlate with each other. And that should be like when the, we decided that was our first step. What do we have as an existing land use map? No, we don't have a future land use map until they change. And so we have the land use map to the right there, and that's our zoning map to the left. And we'll tell you how to get a zoning map. So I know that at least two neighborhoods here today are going through their um, their sub area plans, and they are being asked to give because uh, we've been so adamant about we our neighborhood plans should be included. They are trying to play catch up with that. You understand that was something that was promised. You know they're upset a little bit because they're saying, well, you know, you're making us do this work. It's like you should have done what you promised. It's like the guy robs you and then complains because he's got to work it off. <laughs> work it too hard. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you got to do catch up. And and um, and this isn't some, anything about city planners. It's just about policy. 
Um, so you want to, because you're kind of being pushed right now, much more than the rest of us who have some time to watch what's going to happen to you, like you should be looking at this. At its heart, at its heart, these plans are about land use and zoning. I mean, there's a lot of stuff about we want, you know, to protect our, our cultural heritage and we want to do this and do that. That's not planning's job. They don't, that's not the heart of what they do. That's another department. For them, you have to, every, it's like the dog who hears about food, blah, 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 food, blah, blah, blah. That's what you should be to you. It should be blah, 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 zoning, blah, 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 land use, because that's going to make the difference in your community. Um, so, so you want to take a look at areas, you want to see what's there right now, and visualize in 20 years what you, what you see. And, and it is always about preserving neighborhood identity and cultural identity. And, and how do you help preserve that through the zoning and the land use? How do you say, I, I may not want high rises where you think they should be? Or maybe not at all. And some areas, some neighborhoods can accommodate, Beacon Hill can accommodate some density. We have a space for that. Monte Vista, maybe not. I mean, and River Road, they're already developed as far as they can go. But there are other neighborhoods that there is some space still to, to accommodate some of that. Yes, ma'am. So I'm Edwina Center from the uh, Monte Vista Terrace Neighborhood Association. Where? Who? Who? I was going to ask where, but evidently. Who is taking care of the environmental impact and the infrastructure problem? Okay. Okay. Nobody's thinking about that. Oh, don't worry about that. That'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's not part of the party, but you know. But, 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 but that is a valuable no, question. No, I know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I just wanted to respond to that. But okay. that is a valuable question to ask, and I think that other city departments that haven't been involved in this this process understand that, like TCI. Uh, we live by the river, so we know the river authority, you know, and there's been some pushback from these different entities in terms of some of the proposals because of it. So, so, so I know that you all have dealt with uh, different entities at the, uh, because of things happening in your neighborhood, but I would ask those departments to, to, to bet also. Because it is going to require infrastructure changes, mostly. And, and I always ask, and, and a lot of us are always asking, how does that affect displacement? How does that affect property values? Are we going to be able to stay in these neighborhoods in 20 years? Is you know the, the family down the street who's got young children, are those children going to be able to still be in this neighborhood? That's, to me, the big, because revitalization and form-based zoning, if, if a developer sees a neighborhood, and it's got, you and if we do go to form-based zoning or something similar to it, and they say, oh, okay, there's a single family lot, but I can have that change to RM4, the property values, go, speculation, I mean, in my neighborhood, it's already there. They're like vultures just waiting. And so, you know, something to ask is, what about affordable housing? What about displacement and, and the issues that come with those development. How can we have the best of both worlds? Because if we constantly tell them we're against, we're against, we're against, we should be forming a vision. Right. We should be saying, this is the vision we have for our communities, and we, you need to be helping us achieve that. And we have to understand that people are coming. Right. It's not just for me, it's us. Right. Right. That those people are coming, but but how do we have the best of both worlds? Because I just believe we can. I just do. It, we're not stupid. You know, we can we can figure this out, and it doesn't take a sledgehammer; it takes a scalpel. Let's figure out how to keep our neighborhoods. Uh, Amelia Valdez, a historic Westside Resident Association. We're just trying to stay alive on the West Side, in my opinion. Born and raised there, uh, density and high rises and everything is always it's going to come through, like you said, uh, affordable housing and everything. And we work really hard, you know, with coalitions and Dalma and I and meeting. Is, is, is sleepless nights and just try to see how we can help our community and we to try to go back to the residents and explain to them the hard working class of the west side right just to try to make to understand and i know you did our meeting and we appreciate that is when i look at this map uh i look at it and i'm learning um kind of getting my phd in west side right to try to understand it to try to tell a little 
homeowner, hardworking homeowner, that this is this is going to happen, and this is going to be good enough for them that they invested most of their lives, right? So um, when I see this, and this is what's going to be in the future, and, and you help me understand, is the 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 yellows are. Our, our residents, the reds are high density. I mean, the reds are institutions. Institutions, so then the, the, the yellows are, the, or the brown, whatever yellows are in there are residential. Yes. Residential? All the, the, this, this color here is like single family residential. Okay. So you have low density residential in a lot of that area, and then you see these pockets. Where's what the history? Guadalupe Street is in there. The green line. I don't see it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Right, that's right where in the middle. I mean, that's where that's where the density is going to start happening because the rest of the neighborhoods have been pushing back. I mean, the only reason we have a voice is because of people in this room. I mean, the fact that we are across six, seven council districts and that we're supporting each other for the first time in history, and they do not, and that voice is the thing that, the pressure we put on our local officials, and it means getting out that vote, but but they're, they're listening. And so Guadalupe Street, since we're pushing so hard in the other neighborhoods, the west side is starting to look better and better. And the reason it hasn't so far, it's been explained to me by, by, by a developer, is because the lots are so small. Because of the density that already exists, it's hard to buy several lots to put up what they want. But what I don't understand is everybody wants density because it's going to create better transportation. The west side is the densest part of the city, and yet we have the worst transportation. Like, it's not always about density, sometimes it's about money. And so, so that's that's a point I would bring Sometimes up. Sometimes it's an understatement. I'm trying to be nice because I'm being filmed. <laughs> yeah. so, and okay. it was just well, us I inside the meeting. So, Cynthia, what I've heard about the corridors, because I know it's already happening on Zamora and Martin and all those areas, is that folks that already have some form of business there, that they're coming through, whether they're going to keep their business or they're going to push them back a little bit in their in their areas, but they're already getting approaches on can you keep the same business you have for a long time? Or well, there's a little puestecito, a little area, and some of those are are are, are happening or might not happen because of the pressures of their land use. As soon as land use changes, you think we're paying attention? Developers are definitely paying attention. And that's where they start buying the land, even as it's going through, they're starting to make those offers. That's not to put down developers. You know what I can say this about developers? They don't lie to us. They want to buy the land cheap. They want to develop it and get as much bang for their buck as they can. We, we know that about them. I'm not even sure it's reasonable to expect that they be good players, but that's what the city's for. The city and our elected officials are there to mitigate that and to say what's healthy for our constituents and how can we have a compatible and thoughtful development. And so, so that's what you need to look at when you're looking at your West Side plan is look at and see where can I see that happening? Where can I see some of that thoughtful that will help promote our local neighborhoods? And that person can make a gradual rise in property values so that 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 their property becomes more valuable. But, but when it goes like this from like in Beacon Hill, from there to there in five years, that's when displacement happens. And that is all because of speculation. We have a question back here, of uh, A comment. Uh, uh, part of we need to talk about overlays also, and uh, I can drop in any time because for a for Monarchy Park, we have to consider not only what they're proposing in the land use, but how does that reach back to our plan then and the land use in our NCD? And that's important. We've worked through that with them, I think, by the I wasn't meeting Tuesday. We're still trying. Uh, we met with the, we did have the opportunity, it was very eye-opening, to see people that were on the original NCD writing when they <clears throat> met with Garrett and we looked at the plan, the uh, original Medicaid Park plan, then what do we have today or where are we going with the land use? And just one comment, uh, just a warning and a head up, head up to all of us. Right now, the city 
through the uh, San Antonio Tomorrow is talking about land use. What you see in the charts for zoning is not being proposed yet. That would require a change in the UCD, and the city has not started to look at that. We have to be paying attention to make sure that when they start, and there is a proposal out there that changes the ICD uh, zoning, and that would have an impact because that would go into the UCD also. So he's making a good point, and then, sir, I, I, I recognize that. He makes the point that this gets much more complicated, although it, it, it doesn't get harder. So you've got NCDs, you've got historic districts, you've got the transportation land use plan. You'll have plans for transportation and sustainability that they're working on now, plans for affordable housing they're working on now, that have some zoning issues attached to them, some by right zoning issues. Then you have um, these new sub-area plans. And Magny Park um, is a poster child for a neighborhood being steadily destroyed by zoning changes. In fact, one of the zoning commissioners said, we are destroying this neighborhood one zoning change at a time because it's in such a desirable area. And so those are lessons to be learned as we support our, our sister neighborhood, but also that how do you keep that from happening? and yet still do the things that need to be done. Yes, sir, did you have a um, In general, as we look at the city being, going through this metamorphosis and, and we talk about this, is there, first of all, does schools play into this? They should. And when we talk about schools, the one thing that I hate in San Antonio, we talk about protecting our kids Yet and still, we put our schools on these super highways, and the kids go out there and get hit by cars or have the potential of doing that. So as we go forward, I believe that we look at how we develop our neighborhoods, and when these schools come together, I think that this is something that as a group of all of us, no matter where you live, can look at and say, when you're going to build a school, especially if it's an elementary school, that it be deep into the neighborhood. Well, part of that, you know, as a former high school teacher, it's because the land is cheap. Because districts look for places near railroad tracks or freeways so because the land is cheaper, but yes. And when you're talking about displacement, when you're talking about people having to move out of our neighborhoods, that income inequality in our city, one of the remedies is education. Well, as soon as the schools start to improve, the kids are pushed out that really need it. So all of these are like, it's like tentacles. Right. It's like that butterfly effect that, that it's not just this one thing, it just keeps building until you realize this, we could, we could get it right this time because we are a history of a city. My family's from the west side. There are scars all over families in this city where neighborhoods were destroyed for the good of the city. Freeway through your neighborhood, or you know, we want to put up that pink mall. Remember before UTSA was here that we called it the pink elephant? Yeah, there were people dragged out of their homes in protest for that. Now it's you know something. Yes. So uh, it, you are correct in that the zoning won't be done until later, but it will be done in 2020, and they're they're looking. This is part of what they're looking at for zoning. So when you work for the city or you're a planner, you're looking out here and saying, what is the zoning we want? and What do we have to do with land use to get there? So the two are closely tied together and, and are important. And that's why it's important for us to get as informed as we can be now to understand what's happening with this so that we can make the changes that we feel are important for our neighborhoods at this level. Because if we miss this opportunity, then it's in place already for the zoning and they're gonna be on that. They're, they're looking at that now. So this is stuff, some of us have worked on this for a long time. My head still swims when I'm looking at this stuff. You just have to try and you look again and you look again and you work with it a little bit and you go, you know, talk to other people who might have some experience. You ask your council person. You tell your council person this land use stuff. I don't know. It's it's 
we need to have more time and ask to sit, you know, even sit with them, see if they know what the land use categories are. See if they've got a staff person that's familiar enough with this to help you out. Because if they don't, what are they voting on? How are they, how are they making that vote? So that's also part of what, as neighborhoods, we need to be doing when we're advocating for ourselves. Because for the city's benefit, the sooner they get it through, the better, both as far as how it keeps the citizens from having a minimal input, but the, the staff, the council staff also. So we need to push from the bottom up. and. And you know, if you have to, I don't like to say shame them into admitting they don't know, but, but say, hey, we need help with this. Can, do you have a staff person that can help us with this? And go to those community input meetings, even though it's not about input lots of times, it's about we're gonna show you what we're doing, and then you maybe get to put some stickers on some posters or something. But, and so you need to speak up with those and say, well, we've looked at our neighborhood land use plan, and we've looked at what you're proposing, and we're really worried about X. Get specific, pick one or two things, and really get them to tell you what that's truly gonna mean. Stick, you just have to be persistent. It's and sometimes dreadful. they'll put it in binary terms, like on the west side. Well, if we don't do all this, you will stay in poverty forever. No one will ever, you know, we don't dress you up and do all this, you're gonna be just, you know, and, and I know for some people that's a genuine concern. Revitalization on the west side, of, of, and your councilwoman is one of them, like that's a real <laughs> issue. But it does, it's not an either or. I mean, this is about working and bringing the right kind of locally owned, you know, revitalization to different neighborhoods and not just, well, let every developer come in because we're so poor. You know, it, it's, there, there has to be where a pushback and so that there's a ground where everyone's working together. Yes, ma'am? Uh, yes. Can you point out where um, the blue what the blues are for? Industrial? Industrial. Okay, can you show me where Denver Heights is and yes. Historic Gardens is, please? Yes. Okay, see the hill. I see La Bata. There's 37 and there's downtown. What's the blue? See La Bata. So I'm still going down? No, it's so yeah. no, it's not. Up to 37. My right is right there. What the bottom is? Oh, no, no. Am I near it? No, you no, go back. Go up. Uh, that's bad. Keep going. And stop. Right there. Can you show me where the Denver Heights Neighborhood Association is and also where uh, Historic Gardens? Look behind you. And if you can't, that's okay. We don't know it's here. It's, that's why I have this map up here so people can ask specific questions. You're on it. You're on it. Yeah, I mean, that's the right. right there. Right. 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 So the gentleman mentioned earlier about school, I mean about the schools. Uh, what I've seen in my neighborhood, I live right, oh I'm sorry, my name is Barbara McDonald. I overlapped, overlapped with Denver Heights and with the old Denver Heights and with Historic Gardens, which is not really neighborhood association anymore, but I live in that area. And um, it's interesting, everybody's touched up on a little thing about the infrastructure and the environment. They're on the corner of East Commerce and Hackberry. Three beautiful historical buildings were torn down um, for whatever reason. And so what I'm seeing is by the time you get ready to speak up, it's a done deal. Sorry. I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble, but it is. Because what I have in my neighborhood, I love change. Please don't misunderstand me. I think change and growth and development is awesome. But I feel like I've been in this meeting before. 
still talking about the same things that were done 30 years ago. And um, it's sad that we get so, you spread out. Everybody can't be at a meeting every week, every weekend during the week. Everybody can't do that. If you can, you're great, okay? But it, it's sort of hard to keep up with all the meetings. And it's sort of hard to keep up with what's going on with overlap, with overlap. And my neighborhood is overlap, and I really don't know exactly. All I know is I'm a taxpayer. I pay taxes, and they're behind. But um, on the in my neighborhood with infrastructure, it's not there. And we have the high density buildings. Okay, we have the two, three-story apartments that are double. And if anybody tell you, oh, the east side is really Florida, I don't know what part of the east side, because where I am, all those places, the, the realtors that went in and did all their work, those houses are now for rent and for sale. I don't understand that. You know, so you come along with some new pine, and you stick it up, you put a wood, a fence up, and you do all this stuff, you take down the original gingerbread, Victorian gingerbread, you put up all the stuff, so it, it's, it's not selling, you know? And you said 2020, it's not gonna really be 2020, it's gonna be 2030, because they're trying to even get that amended to change because San Antonio's not ready, I just came back from California, California's definitely not ready, so they're trying to get all that pushed back. Uh, I commend you for what you're doing. It's an awesome job, it's an awesome task. Um, well, the streets where all these streets are, well, all these beautiful little houses, and I mean, if you drive in the area, it's just really neat. But you're roller coasting on the street. What person wants to come from Fort Sam and drive over there and buy one of those homes, or even rent one of them? You know, it used to be where, as you had, uh, you could pass a law where there's no alcoholic beverages within five feet of a school. And now, all up and down, Kids, you know, our kids. So yeah. it, it's 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 a fight, and it's it's perseverance, it's perseverance, it's perseverance. I think the growth and development in San Antonio is awesome. I call it SOS, the same old soup warmed over, just with different technology, exactly. different ingredients. Yeah. It's a scare tactic. Yeah. No. Okay, because you do have glorified gentrification. Okay, because you can come and you can buy my property, and as a senior, I want to stay where I am. I want to live where I am for the past 50, 60 years. I want to live where I was growing up at. But at the same time, my neighbors can't because their taxes have already gone up. And so what do they think? They get one of these letters, oh, they can give me $50,000. Glorified gentrification. What do you do with that? Well, there's, there's, and sorry to jump in like that, you know, I mean, the, the advocacy is ongoing, and, and you're right, it's a big mountain, and neighbor, all you can do is try to get as many people engaged as you can, it's a constant battle, but there are people working at the state level, you have to contact your state rep and your senator, Bernal, uh, Via Real when he was in the legislature, Menendez, they're working at trying to find ways to, you know, do like something on the property taxes where you have a legacy exemption and so forth. It's just another thing you have to track and, and keep on top of. But let your, again, let your council person know that that's important, that having seniors be able to age in place. And I know Barbara, she works on senior issues all the time. Betty works on senior issues. This is something they've been fighting for for a long time. And our new commissioner from District 2, Chris Dawkins. Oh, oh yes. 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 this is what I can say because I get those feelings too. Like, what am I spending my time doing this for? I've been here three generations. My family's on the west side. I have never, ever seen citizens have a voice the way we have a voice now. And it's not, when you said you're doing a great job, we're doing a great job. We just have a new West Side Coalition. When people, this is the first time that we have been forceful enough to push back and we have made huge, I mean just like things I can't even believe that we've been able to accomplish. Part of it's gonna be about getting out that vote. 
You have you have to get your vote out. I don't care who they vote for. That vote means everything. That's Can you say that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> and Councilman Courage told us that um, outside a meeting, he said, "You realize part of the reason you have power is the vote because you you last last time we did vote, but also um, this idea that we've been criticized in the press, you know, tier one, and it's like." That, that we have too much power with our council people, and it's like, because they think it's those people that go to the meeting, it's the constituents. Tier one is their constituents. It's, it's 45, 46 neighborhoods across seven council districts of people in neighborhoods who are saying, we don't want that, or we want this. You have to pay attention to us. Seems like that's called democracy. Hello. Yeah. And so, and so I don't think that's inappropriate at all. So that's why we need to make our voices known with our separate council people that tier one is more than it's neighbors supporting neighbors. It's standing shoulder to shoulder and saying, this is something we all share in terms of concerns and desires. Yes. Yes, Brady. I'm from Lucardinas. And when you heard that, that at Luz Gardens, I couldn't hear it. Uh, the and, and when you interpret it, it's uh, the gardens. Uh, and it, uh, one time they used to have a lot of little farms, and uh, we considered them gardens. And so for that reason, there's people there that has owns uh, one acre, two acres, three acres, very low density. In my area, where I live, it's not so bad, but uh, we have about all oh, about quarter of an acre, and uh, so you have to realize that there's three west sides. We have the immediate west side, we have the middle west side. And we have the four west side, and they're totally different. Totally. Yes. Uh, they're different in uh, infrastructure and in wells and all that. And I'd like to quote this report that uh, uh, the middle west side started with a uh, commerce up there in Santa Mora. Uh, there was a report made where uh, they had the uh, wells, the uh, education the uh, property values and all that, and the uh, one, uh, 281 corridor rated about 83%. When they went to the west side, middle west side, it was rated at 0 0.05, not even one, but that's because of that low density. Uh, they, tried a project not long ago where uh, they were going to build uh, houses that would have been sold for uh, over uh, 150000 and uh, they wanted to sell them right there at the uh, west side on, on the Rick Barrera Parkway, uh, now uh, I mean uh, Old Highway 90, what they used to call it, and uh, they couldn't sell them those houses for 90000 Why? Because uh, what might be affordable housing to you is not affordable to me because of my income. So uh, we had a lot of trouble uh, selling those houses and uh, they finally sold them, you know, and, and, uh, but then now there's the developers going out there trying to buy the land and they're kind of putting pressure on you. And what they want to do is uh, they want to build multiple houses. They want to build apartments. And we all understand that uh, when you have that kind of a infrastructure in your community, for some reason or another, it brings up the crime level. And that's uh, and I say that we have to look for, in other words, once you don't fit all, we do have every part of the city has a different need. So uh, up there uh, on, on Enrique Barrera Parkway, we'll be we're building uh, uh, eventually, 
It's going to be a college right now. It's called the Westside Training Center. And uh, so they have uh, the land all the way around. And some people are calling for uh, having apartments uh, and stuff like that. And some of us are saying, no, don't build anything in there. Even though there's, there's a, a, a lot of uh, uh, empty lots, because we're looking about 20 years from now, where this college is gonna expand. I was telling my grandkids this morning when I came to college, about uh, uh, 40 uh, AD, <laughs> down here. <laughs> and and uh, it was just the structure down there. Now we were lost probably about five minutes trying to find this place. So yes, we have to look at this picture. And like I say, you know, we have to do a lot of this thinking. If you people want less density, uh, of course, uh, we can accommodate that. But the main thing is that we all have to work together. And like, when it comes to my community, I'd like for you to support us. And when it comes to your community, I'll support you. Support. Let's take. Okay. I'm sorry, Brady. I thought you were playing with you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you're that cute. My name is Brady. I represent the Mission Reach Hot Wheels Community Association, the second nicest neighborhood association in San Antonio. Basically, um, all our problems are very similar. Um, it's a very complex issue. If you want to see it in action, wait 12 days and go to council. We are going to see them propose a blanket rezone for the World Heritage Area. Whether you feel this is the greatest thing since sliced bread or a continuation of 300 year tradition of exploiting the locals for profit, the background of it is this. Basically, they are saying community input. We're basically some community input. Your association plans, which can be used for you or against you. They're a double-edged sword. Ours, I don't think, have been touched this century. Um, so anyway, the input in the last couple of years, it has some symposia, et cetera, on what the community wanted in this area, and they are running with that. That is under old terminology, whereas it, for example, if you say, yeah, we like housing. OK, we said housing, so MF100 is housing. You get it. When the what they really meant, or what I interpret it as, is we wanted single family or residential or owner occupied. Our area, for instance, is so poor, we're in the opportunity zone. So if you've got any um, capital gains, park it in our area and you won't be taxed if you hold it for 10 years. A lot of money to be made there. We also have the highest percentage of people in San Antonio that receive nutrition assistance. So if you look at it on paper, we're also number two in the amount of murders for District 3. So um, if you look at it on paper, you think this is a Terrible area. I wouldn't touch it with a ten-foot pole, but there's a lot of predatory um, investors and a lot of tension in the area. I'm watching properties go left and right. So um, once again, it's an example of where you can see how things can be used for and against you. And if are they going to go forward with this under old regulations, old zoning, old land use, or will the switcheroo halfway through? Now, this has been changed six times, and so it's the square peg and the round hole, so to speak. The World Heritage Plan has been changed six times. Yes. It's been modified and changed stuff has been added and then retracted. Others have been taken out, etc. Um, we've knocked it down twice at zoning. It's going without zoning commission approval to city council. So if a mayor Scully puts her stamp on it, it's going to go through. <laughs> mayor Scully. Yeah, the other guys aren't what he <laughs> But anyway, you'll see the same thing happening all over town, the uh, Hay Street Bridge and other projects. So this is a learning experience. I hope that you can support the majority of the people in this area that want to see this done right, not done quickly. And I'll give you an example of how complacency is causing a problem. The city sent out 2,000 letters people within 500 foot of any zoning change. You know how many they got back? Five. You know how many were for the proposal? One. Four were against it. 
Those are meaningless numbers. It's four to one against it, but five people know. It needs more than that. So we've gone out, canvassed businesses, etc., cetera, um, tried to get it where it is equitable for all, and we're all in this together. What happens in Mankey Park affects us, and it's coming down to us, and it's going to go to your neighborhood. What happens in an undeveloped area, we're very similar to the west side. We have larger lots, etc. When things open, you think, oh, we don't have a large lot in our area? Well, look at that shopping center, look at that H-E-B, look at that, what could happen with this. So we're all in it together, we can learn from each other, and I hope that we can do things right and not quickly and wrong. So hopefully when we have our website come up, we may have a space for individual neighborhood issues. Um, we really want to focus today on, on the land use, but because that's an important issue and the issue you brought up, that might be something we could add to our neighbor to our site that we can have each of you so that we can have supported zoning. When, when you have some the rest of the neighborhood show up at a zoning hearing, and all of these people are there to speak on your behalf, that makes a difference. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Ross Slothhead, and I'm with the Oklahoma State's Neighborhood Association in District 8, just north of the Medical Center, which was actually set up in 1931, been there a long time. And we live and die by land use and zoning because our restrictive covenants expired in 1951, so we're a lot like uh, within the 410 neighborhood, except that we're not subjected to infill development zoning, which is, of course, in Austin, you also there. But I wanted to make a couple of observations, um, because I'm their land use lawyer and land use strategist, frankly, and we've been doing it for 20 years. And we were one of the three neighborhoods that had any representation when the UDC was rewritten, and some of the stuff we're talking about today is very familiar to us. I appreciate your desire to be horizontal and democratic, but I urge you to come up with a few key issues and shout them to the rooftops constantly. Because otherwise, you'll get all bogged down in all oh, this and that in my neighborhood and stuff like that. These are the things we need to realize. The people go to college in planning and they are inculcated into two cults. The cult of density and the cult of mixed use. They will relentlessly come at you with these things. And they will go to professional associations and get awards for doing it. So we need to fight that. We need to also recognize that we're victims because we're residential areas that don't have restrictive covenants. Since the 1970s, virtually all development other than affordable housing projects in San Antonio and Bear County has been with private streets and a gate and very, very tight restrictive covenants with architectural control committees. Other than the people that like to live in historic districts or want to be part of downtown life, most people who are not desperately poor don't even have to fight these battles because they live in something that's been totally configured and tied up for a million years. They can't even paint their door a different color. And we've got to sit here and worry about whether somebody's going to put a MF50. And by the way, you know, MF33 used to be the most density that you could have, and apartments used to be three stories high, not four stories. You could have 50 in downtown. Now we have MF65. There wasn't even an R3. And so what they're doing, the gentleman was really accurate about it. We have a neighborhood plan that we fought to the death for. It was unbearable. And what they're effectively doing is saying, okay, they used to say that the land use plan could not be as specific as zoning because zoning was a function under state law. And the only reason that they were blurring these lines and didn't just tell you that your land use plan was, say, R6, was because that would violate state law. And they just had to do it. They wish they could help you. Now you'll notice that they're spreading them out to include everything. So that gives the planning department absolute power to cram down anything it wants, except in the dominion. Right? <laughs> Except in Elm Creek. So we're, we're lucky with that. So if, if I could urge you, I've heard this thing about form-based development. We need to be screaming and talking to Mayor Ron. No form-based development anywhere. All these things you talk about where you can mobilize people and they'll listen to you are based upon the fact that zoning is a political act. If they get form-based development, zoning will not be a political act. 
I won't let my neighborhood allow planned human development because that takes revisions out of the political process and is put in the planning commission, which is dominated by the development community. And it's easier for the city. The planning department is underfunded. So they would love not to have to do so much and just let the developers do what they want. And by the way, they get their fees from the developers, okay? And the, ba the basis for political contributions in the city is an unwarranted zoning change, right? Because what can a council person do that Cheryl Scully doesn't tell them no? The only thing they can do is do a zoning change. If they upzone you in a way that's unhelpful or, or crazy, that means that the developer bought that land at a price where no one thought they could upzone it, then they upzone it, they make more money. So please fight form based development. Please fight the denigration of the neighborhood plans. And, and, and understand this about the neighborhood plan and they're wanting to go to broader planning areas. When you have a neighborhood plan, people in your neighborhood dictate the land use. When they put you in a broader area, like say the medical center regional area, then you're gonna have people like the ones that run the medical center talking about whether there should be apartments in your residential area, you will lose your majority vote on your land use. One other point, I know I'm hogging it here, but, but I, feel, uh, I have literally been a strategist about all this rotten stuff. So the other thing that they've done is they've allowed your neighborhood plans to become less effective because if they are not renewed every five years, they cease to be consistency plans and they become guides. The planning department flat out refused to renew most neighborhood plans because, quote, we don't have the resources and we're concentrating in the problem areas. I have an amendment to the UDC that I gave to Rob Sanchez that's been sitting around for a year wanting to fix that. We need to fight that, and you can learn all these things about your plan, but you need to empower your organization here with five key talking points, and you need to figure out what those are, you need to take them back to your neighbors and get the grassroots democratic support coming back up. But you need the point of the spear, and it's got to be neighborhood plans, are not going to become consistency plans. They don't have to be renewed every five years. The amount of work it takes to renew a neighborhood plan in terms of volunteerism and herding cats is so desperate it takes years off your life. Now they're going to make us do it again for San Antonio 2020. These are the points that we have to focus on and we have to hammer them home. Thank you. So, Good morning. My name is Terry Vanyas, and I'm president of Mission San Jose Neighborhood Association. And I just want to make two comments. First, uh, we belong to the South Central Community Plan. And uh, when I sit down and I look at that plan, and I look at other neighborhood or community plans, ours, I, I, you know, for the amount of time that was spent on that, it's so unspecific. It's like there were two items on the list that actually got done on that, and it does need to be updated. Uh, it was done in 2005, and uh, the past president had tried to get it uh, updated, and it was never done. Um, on the second issue, um, Brady brought up the issue of the World Heritage overlay uh, rezoning. The land use has already passed. Now they're doing the zoning part. And um, the neighborhoods that are in support of that zoning change are La Vaca, uh, Roosevelt, Lone Star, King William, and Mission San Jose Neighborhood Association. We are in, in support of it because the residents that live next to those businesses that are going to be changed from C2 to C1, and, and actually they don't get their zoning change as long as their business is there, they're still C2. But the neighbors have been for years complaining that we don't get a say of what gets built on a C2. So we have a motel that is creating all this crime that was built in 2005. We didn't have a say in it. Why? Because it was zoned for that. We have businesses that have tire shops and auto uh, mechanic businesses that are really bad neighbors. And the people that live next to them have complained for years. 
And every time we would go and complain to the city, why weren't we told? They said, they don't need to tell you. It's zoned for that. So we would ask, how can we change this? Get the zoning change. The other thing was, we want to protect the mission. The land use around the mission, uh, all the missions, is going to be community commercial, which can right now have C1 and C2. And so we're supporting it to get what the residents that live next to those businesses and to protect the mission. And I just wanted to say, because I know Brady had asked for your support, uh, and I think that that's where we're gonna have a rub, you know, where you have neighborhoods that don't feel the same way on certain issues. So let's focus on the things we do feel the same about, which is um, to be able to have a voice in our communities. I thank you, that you should have been up here instead of me. <laughs> but I had your number, right? Come together. Yeah, we do. And I think um, today, if we look at our handout for the conclusion of this, there were several issues um, that we want to talk about specifically, but I love the idea of coming up with some overreaching themes. And those themes that you mentioned are actually themes that we have been talking about in our meetings. And they and maybe it's time to have some partnerships with outside the loop for 10 folks to start figuring out how to, because we can never get to your council people, right? Sure. Because you have Nod sitting right behind you. Okay, great. Then let's stay after a little bit and let's talk. And through the website, maybe we can figure out and through email which one of those that he mentioned and any others that we want to say these are the ones that we always talk about no matter what because they encompass all of this. For today, um, there was some concerns about this specifically, the, the land use proposal that River Road had come up with. Um, one was that MF33 should be pulled from medium density residential and that those properties that are not conforming be um, perhaps grandfathered. RM4 should be pulled from urban low density residential. You know, look at your, look at your neighborhoods, look at those land uses and see if that's appropriate. Um, that the language added in the, um, and we'll send you the link to the actual um, document draft, says the director of planning department shall make a determination if a use not included in section 35 can reasonably be interpreted to fit in a category where similar uses are described. Interpretations may be ratified by city council upon recommendation by planning commission at a regularly scheduled meeting. Um, a lot of folks have concerns that that gives the planning uh, department director too much power, too much discretion. And that's something we've been told yes, but it goes through you know, city council, it says may. And we all know that the devil's in the details, um, that those tiny things are the interpretations. So that is also a concern that River Road uh, brought up. Look at neighborhood commercial. We haven't even started talking about com neighborhood commercial. Please look at that and your neighborhood and see how you would change any of that, or if you would even add some categories. And examine the uses specified in the mixed use categories to see if they're compatible with your neighborhood plans. Hey, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to propose one other thing. Uh, they have added R4. First of all, I don't like with the, the cult of density. You notice that they've changed all, all the terms, right? Um, so, so there is nothing that's called very high density. It's just called normal, and then you find out that's MF65 or whatever. I perhaps exaggerate. Yeah. But in the low density residential, we need not to let them frame in R4. I talked to my zoning commissioner, and her recollection is that R4 was not included in the low density residential. R4 or RM4? R4. Now, RM4 is different. Okay. I don't want to pretend that a 4,000 square foot lot is a large lot, okay? And I don't want, when we're dealing with stuff where R5 and R6 are the most typical residential stuff everywhere, then that should be medium residential, right? And R4 should be high, but they got R4 calling it low density residential. So if you have a neighborhood plan and your compromise on your land use plan was, you know what, like we have, the, the houses across the street are all R6, even though we're a large lot neighborhood. So we're going to allow our peripheral road to have the, the land, we're going to agree to a zoning of R6 there and get the permanent zoning. And then we're going to have the land use plan, and the land use plan is going to say low density residential. 
well, I can live with R5 even though I wanted R6, but what they're going to do by just sticking that in the last minute, which I don't know, but that was from the Land Development Services Committee. Was it us? Yeah, and so uh, what happened is we're looking all these low density and we're on four. So it's one single family house and 4,000 square units. And so that's the whole neighborhood. I guess that's because city lots are smaller than the old city is. Yeah. I was thinking of the R5, 5,500. Yeah. yeah, and so there, there are some, so it has that range. So when you get into the inner cities, you have some that are even smaller, the R3. Right. So how it initially was, was that was called low density suburban, and they had the higher uh, zoning. But then we said, well, let's have an urban density, a low density, which would fit uh, the neighborhoods. Uh, you know, in downtown area, and what would they cover? <coughs> so that's how it would be. Could we have the R4 be in the urban low density, but not in the other low density? Because the trouble is it's a two-edged sword. On the one hand, if you're sitting on R4, you don't want to be grouped with lower density, higher densities, and have it all done to you. You'd rather be grouped with the lower density. Yes. But if you're me, and, and you were originally subdivided four and a half acres, You've agreed to 6,000 square feet along your perimeter road. You don't want that 6,000 square feet to become 4,000 square feet. So, in a funny way, we have a divergence of interest, even though basically we have a similar objective, just because of how we're placed. So, if that was in the urban one, but not in the other one, then my problem would go away and your problem would remain solved. So, and I think what we're bringing it up, and part of this is. They, it's not even on the website, the May 14th one, so that's why we have to sell, send you uh, what they wrote. I don't think we're ready to take a vote on this. And I think it's going to take a little bit more time to really read these things, to look at them, to have discussions. Where does it fit? How do we protect what we think is our neighborhoods also, but also working with the other neighborhoods? Because this is supposedly going to be a land use plan for all of San Antonio. And you think how diverse, like Stone oh, Oak is from Beacon Hill. Hill. I mean, it's like incredible. You know, I just thought of a strategy that could be used. It's a thing has to go to council anyway. Those neighborhoods that have a land use plan where they thought that low density residential meant something and now it's becoming higher density. Maybe if we, if we created a couple of, of other densities, from which to select, That's then we could require as part of the thing going yes. through that the land use plans of those existing neighborhood plans be relabeled to those things so you don't get into the trap that I voted for one thing but then they change what it meant. Yeah. I think that's what we have That's to sit down and discuss and how we were talking about it in our planning committee. You know, but that's why we created an urban, it was actually historic and it had a very small uh, zoning that we wanted in there, but when it went back, what you see now is a blending. So your land use is supposed to describe what you can do your land for, and it's sort of a guide to tell you what you'd like to do. Zoning then makes it happen, but now when you're reading the land use categories, they're very specific. They're, they're, they're really putting in, you know, you know garden home apartments, which they never define, and they put all of this, which is really attached to zoning. And so they've actually married the zoning with the, the land use plan. May, may I ask you, what, what school, what, what are, what do you call the houses that they're building out and the apartments, well, the houses that they're fixing out, and they're putting, they're adding a little bungalow in the back. What are those called? Mm -hmm. Well, a bungalow, the little back unit is, if it's meant to be lived in, it's called an accessory dwelling unit. Because there are a lot of them they have built, right? Mm -hmm. Quite a few of them, and it's like, what, what, what is that something? I mean, what is that called? Well, you can have an ADU in, in any single family zoning. Um, the qualification more becomes that if I live in the main house, and I have an accessory dwelling unit that I want to rent out, I have to occupy the main house. 
So, but I have almost an at right to add that uh, accessory dwelling unit there. Every single family lot has that, that right, as long as they can meet their setbacks and whatnot. Now, what they can't do is rent out both properties. So there's, there's that qualification. Yes, ma'am. Well, I think those two gentlemen have their hands up. Okay. Okay. I'll just be real quick. Um, yeah, in eight months, you will not have the leverage you have now because of the election year. Use it to your best effect. Your representatives serve you as their privilege, not their right. So remind them of that. No matter what your position or what your concern, use it to your advantage. With a lot of the good, well, oh, Colin Jones didn't want to hear with all the questions and feedback and everything. Yeah, I've got uh, my neighborhood plan here, and I've got this stuff, and I'm ready to go. I have one contribution. I actually looked it up. All hell Google. A football field is 1.3 acres. I can't visualize what an acre is, but we all know what a football field is. So maybe that's a base to start working off of. And from that, before I get started on all of this, I'm still don't understand why to look at the back page of the first handout, and you go through, and there's all the R's in the center column. Right in the MS and all that, and then to the left is the land use plan category of potential zoning districts. You with me? Yeah. Why does the why does say an R four go through the first through all through category low density, category urban low, and medium density? Why does an R four just stay in one? I would make the case that probably because um, density is 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 the issue for the city. And for many neighborhoods, you could have those smaller lots, that you could have a smaller lot and, and more density all the way through those categories. So it goes all the way through, gosh, it goes through medium density. Yeah, it's so, so, so if you're at Beacon Hill, yeah. you're going to have R4s all the way through that, because we okay. have an R4 lot. Okay. Okay. And it's the history of the city. So when you look through the muni codes, uh, right now, it, they're, they're always carried forward. So what went in the, the lower one is then also in the next one. So if you can have an R4, goodness knows you can have an R5. So we'll okay. just put both of those. So an R4 is one house on 4,000 right. square acre. Right. An RM4, which was changed in 2015, is four houses in a 4,000 square feet. Right. So that's a, a higher density. Than an R four. R four is a single family of four thousand. Oh, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, 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 yes, ma'am. Because we've been there. Um, Holly Noel, Mickey Park, and uh, over the last two weeks, we've been struggling with this issue related to imagined homes coming in, and because uh, of old potty maps, being able to subdivide fifty foot lots into two different twenty five foot lots and build two two separate skinny homes. Um, that's out of character to the neighborhood. But more recently, um, there we've been told that uh, to another <coughs> developer wants has, has purchased a lot, 65 foot lot, which and I I'm sorry I don't know if it's R4 or RM4, um, but um, it had a single family home on it um, that was torn down and. They have been, these developers have been told they can build two dwellings on the property, not a main and an accessory dwelling, but two, two, because they have two lots, two, two, two 25 lots. foot lots. But no, 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 because no, th this doesn't apply to, it, it's not covered by the loophole that allows the situation with imagined homes. Mm -hmm. But they've been told. They've been given approval to build on a single lot um, these two dwellings that are exactly the same, not a prime and an accessory building. And but it's not a duplex. There, there, there's like a one foot space between the two buildings. It's either R four or R M four. I'm not sure. That's the thing. R M four. But so when we ask them, so are you planning to subdivide the lot at some point and sell it? Uh, sell it as two separate lots down the road. And they wouldn't give us a straight answer. So we're trying to figure out would that be allowed? 
down the road? Well, I know right now, like they, and, and, and then we got to move on because we do have to strategize for the future we're running out of time. Um, is that in Beacon Hill, what we thought of as a lot is really a building site. And within that, there are four lots. In each one of those four lots, the city is saying they can build something on it. Now, our neighborhood is comfortable with that kind of density, but that's not for everybody. And yeah, that's something we have to, that is a problem. Let's strategize about where we're going to go from here because we're running out of time. Where do we go from here? So, every, you've heard all kinds of, you know, you have to get in touch with your council. This is far from being done. I mean, this is still evolving. This is still um, in flux. And, and there are meetings that they are having um, that you need to go to to learn more and inform the rest of us. And we need to perhaps come to come and send out, and we can work on that issue, work on some overarching themes. And those of us that want to work specifically on that issue, perhaps we can meet. And you, we can work on, on crafting something that we can send out to neighborhoods. Again, no one ever says, this is how Tier 1 feels. I mean, you've seen today, you can have two different neighborhood associations feel differently about an issue. So we, we're, we're members, and but when you say I'm a member of Tier 1, that means you have organizing power behind you. That you are probably going to have support of most of the other neighborhoods. So why don't we, what, send out um, maybe some suggestions about, about what we advocate for. You have some suggestions here. Take this back and share with your community. Barbara. So um, these meetings, if you all read fine print, which is, uh, says, it's an hour and a half, and the first 30 minutes is an open house. And for those of us who've been to these before, you know what that means. It means those uh, easels with masks on. And then, then it says, and a brief presentation. So when we first saw this, uh, we said, wait a minute, that's not a workshop. Those are going to be staff people that have no power to make any change. And it's basically like a re regurgitation uh, of what you see in your handouts. So the, the, I would suggest that the other thing that we do is we have some, some, some questions at that time. So because I think these are just kind of, I'm going, and, uh, and I'm mainly because I want to see what they're doing, but, but I also think that you need to ask your councilman for workshops for his neighborhoods, because these are not workshops. These are being put on by the city staff. You know, they ran right of this thing through. And I have to tell you something. One day, this woman here, Gemma Kennedy, called me and said, hey, you want to go to this meeting? And I was like, oh, I just woke up, you know. So I said, sure. <laughs> so we drove down to the Comprehensive Plan Committee, which is where this is going to go before it goes to council, which is where it went before it went to council. And we were shocked to see what the proposal was. In the draft that some of you all got, the May 14th draft, that was the ordinance that they were going to pass, and they were taking it to council the next day. The next day, and nobody knew. Nobody. So you got an email from Tier 1 saying, please call your council person for the next day, less than 24 hours, and ask them to, to, not, to vote no. Well, I want you all to know, every single council person voted no to not accept the ordinance. It was a unanimous vote. And that, and it was during the day they were doing the charter review, so that took four hours, and this was right, the item right after the charter review. So it was perfect timing, because more people had time to get to their city council people. But remember that your city council person voted no. They voted to postpone the vote on this ordinance that we spent two hours on. And this is the tip of the iceberg for most of us. So I wanted to just make sure that you ask your council people to have a workshop. And uh, of course, sometimes these council people, they don't understand all the stuff they have to do. They'll say, oh, we'll get the, the planning department to do a workshop. Really? I mean, I don't think that's a good idea, but there are a lot of planning professionals, and you have to find them. And I've been looking at all the colleges and universities. It's, it's difficult, but you need to find people to help you understand this. Your council office should be finding people to understand it. So I just wanted to tell you, now we've already asked to, uh, District 1, and they're putting together workshops. We've already been so aggressive about it. But if you don't know about them, you need to call that office. But for other districts that are here, the best thing to do is to ask your council office for workshops so you can understand this. 
because as we cannot tell, it's very difficult. Thank you. Can you send us a list of uh, maybe some type of facilitators or somebody? <laughs> That's hard. Yeah, okay. you know, district one. Two. Okay. Well, district one, Trevino is going to be giving workshops. Right. Yeah. Okay. He's down. And his staff and her is very knowledgeable of this. She's the she's the she's she's this. And she's the one who actually designed this. Okay. A little handout. Because we had all these the questions. Board. She did it in the evening before the council vote. Well, I'll ask them to use her and they'll yes. be. And some council people are more neighborhood friendly than and others, but yeah. she does work with is it Charles. 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 Okay, Charlie. Okay. So, yeah, if you speak to Chris she'll she'll just point you to Chris. Okay. Chris. okay. Chris. okay. Chris. So if things are happening because we're not paying attention, mm -hmm. we're paying attention now. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Oh, but we have a couple more things to say. Yes. When okay. is the city council proposed to vote on this? Well, it's going to the comp plan first, and it's proposed to go to the comp plan uh, August 15th. That's what the uh, city clerk told me. But it, so it hasn't gotten yet to where it's going to go. But as far as I'm concerned, it needs to be postponed. Yes. That's a long time. And having bodies at the comp, uh, the comp plan commission or uh, committee. committee and the governance that comp plan committee is powerful and when you show up those bodies in the room mean something i mean you say oh well it doesn't matter we don't get to speak i can tell you when that is filled with people it's almost electrifying and they pay attention to that yes and, and I, okay. just one other issue that i think would be worthy of a tier one look at is the issue of the board of adjustment because something else that has, yeah. because for, for us it doesn't matter to them what our ncd says it doesn't matter what the um you know the UDC said because they a majority of those people seem to be willing to vote for various requests um, that don't and they don't seem to be following the stated guidance in terms of what a hardship is or whatever. And so I, I think that that might be even more important or as or more important than That's more an than issue. Other and issues. You might be able to help us sort of lead that. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, one more person. Um, I'm currently serving on one of the regional planning teams. And this is important because they've already started using these land use codes on yes. those. So it's important that we say, you know, if you're, if you're serving on one, let's slow down. I mean, they've got their schedule they're trying to beat and all, but this is too important. The other thing is we need to be recommending to them that we not be doing this planning in a vacuum. You know, they have planners and, you know, I'm on the UTSA area. You know, we, we say, okay, well, right here is UTSA, and, you know, over here is a quarry, and over here is a quarry. It's very difficult to see anything else that's on the map. And so the planning takes place, and everyone says, well, if this is going to be a transit quarter, then we probably need commercial along there, you know, without looking at what's already there and, and the effect that it will have. So in my, in my thinking, it's wise to do it that way, but then step back and look at what's already there and what effect will it have on those neighborhoods. The other thing is, in every one of those plans, those regional plans, I, I added, they, they start with listing goals. One of mine was protecting the integrity of existing neighborhoods, and that got put in there. It doesn't mean I necessarily always feel that that's happening, but when I say you have to step back and look at what you said you wanted and the effect it has on the neighborhood. For example, Mr. Lopez is in a acreage subdivision that backs up to Crew Road. Well, you know that when they do the planning for that area, they're going to want to put commercial along there or multifamily. And you have to think about the fact that, you know, if, if just one of those properties, one of those acreage properties that has an elderly homeowner, you know, their estate wants to sell that property, then it just becomes a domino effect. So I, we need to insist that they look at not just what 
would be ideal there, but what would be ideal there given how the neighborhood is now? Thank you. Councilman Coleman is taking notes, and so all of this, um, when she's finished, we will send out to you the notes on this. And, now, okay. and, and of course, and Nowcast will have all of this that will be on our website uh, that you can go back and show your community or you have to be refreshed. I think a lot's happened that's really important today that we'll continue on. Yes, ma'am, are you going to close this out? Well, I just I, I'd I, like to ask you a real quick question. Uh, and actually, it's a definition. I'd like to ask the lawyer. Uh, well, sir, when, I tell you what. What, what they say, uh, grandfather. What do they mean? It, 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 means they'll change, it means they'll change the rules, but the change in the rules won't make you change your use of your property until you change it or sell it. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I, I want to thank everyone for coming, and I just wanted you to know that. Uh, we've had uh, at least uh, 40 people here uh, representing, and I, I, this is not exactly accurate because I couldn't see uh, some of the people that came in uh, later, but 25 neighborhoods at least. Yeah. 25 neighborhoods. If you did not sign in, please do so before you leave, and thank you for being here, and we can continue. Uh, among ourselves talking, we have the room until 12.